If you have lost yourself down the speedrunning rabbit hole on YouTube, I know I certainly have, you have probably heard of Tazbot. Tazbot is a tool-assisted speedrun robot. And if you don't know, speedrunning is an awesome community of hackers and gamers who come together to break and play games as fast as they possibly can. Tazbot can, pretends to be a controller and sends button presses to the console with inhuman precision. And this means that he can do some very interesting things. Tazbot has been alive for about 10 years, and in that time, he has raised $1.3 million for charity. <laughs> Duango AC, who is the keeper of Tazbot, and Blaster Mac, who is the guy who plays the games, are here to tell us about his latest exploits. Folks, this is going to be awesome. Let's give it up. So glad to have such a wonderful cloud crowd. I am Duango AC. Welcome to the Taskbot Ocarina of Time Ace Talk. I am a security consultant with Bishop Fox by day, but keeper by Taskbot by night. And this talk is an opportunity for me to combine both of my passions in one talk, which is awesome. I'm thankful to Bishop Fox for making it possible for me to travel here and be here. I also want to specifically thank Stitch, who I hope is somewhere, oh, right there, <laughs> who personally invited me over three years ago to participate in this. So, so excited to be here. I really want to show you how we can take glitches and exploit them to create a work of transformative art from one of the most popular games of all time. There are a couple of things I want to chat about before we go on. Uh, there is just a massive number of people who contributed to what you're about to see from inside and outside of the Taskbot community. Over 25 people contributed to this over the course of about two and a half years, uh, with even more people involved in prior research. I'd especially like to thank Soren, who was the director and the main pillar of what we did for what we call Triforce Percent. You'll understand a little more about that in a bit. Uh, also, Isofreeze of Retro Game Mechanics Explained. If you have seen the video, on this, you'll note that the slides are very similar. Uh, he directly helped me create this and worked with me to produce this uh, slideware. You'll see what I mean when, I, when we get into it. Uh, there's also Blaster Mac here, who will be helping by playing the game. Now, I have to say, the one person in this planet, on this planet, who has managed to pull off running the original cartridge was Safe State. They did it at Summer Games Done Quick 2022, a couple of weeks ago. We spent several weeks trying to replicate what they did without success. We have been unable to make it to an assisted speedrun of this because of various different issues. So uh, we are trying to recreate what they did without their skill level. Uh, instead of trying to do it on an original cart, we are going to be using a flash cart. I'll show you what that looks like here. You'll see there are some addresses here on this screen. Uh, we are cheating a little bit. We are using a practice ROM that shows the angle of uh, what Link is facing and a few other things, as well as the buttons that are being pressed. So this allows us to also do tool-assisted speedrun-like things, like save states and being able to frame advance, which are going to come in really handy. So what we're going to do right now is go through the intro and play through the game. This intro scene is a little long. We'll leave that in the corner here as we get started. So you'll see that in that corner down there while we're just going through this rather repetitive intro section. So I'm going to break this talk into about three. Wow, that wind came through. Sorry about the mic. Uh, we're going to talk about three main parts in this talk. The first one is going to be how we're preparing to execute a glitch called a stale reference manipulation. It's basically a use after free exploit. That's the more common name for it. We're also going to do a dive into how we're doing the initial arbitrary code of payload execution. Um, like we take ACE and then do something interesting with it. And then part three is where we get to see all of the amazing things you can do once you have arbitrary control over a console. So I should note that the majority of part one also applies to the ACE, any percent run, of, of if you wanted to beat the game quickly, it also applies to what you would get on the original uh, console. On the original Nintendo 64, it uses the same sequence. So let's talk about what it takes to land an exploit on one of these. So the state of the buttons and analog control stick for each of the four controllers is stored at memory address 8011D790. Each controller port takes up six bytes. There are two bytes for all of the buttons, A, B, Z, start, the D-pad, L and R shoulder buttons, and the C buttons. 
There's one byte for the analog stick's X offset, one byte for its Y offset, one byte for an error code in case the controller is unplugged or other errors, and then one padding byte that's always zero. Altogether, we have a total of 24 bytes. So by pressing buttons and moving around, the, by moving the control stick around, uh, we can change the values in, to whatever we like if you're superhuman. Now, under normal circumstances, the game's code reads these values to know where the player is currently, uh, but what the player is pressing and updates the game accordingly. But the memory here is just like any other memory in the system, and game code is found in memory and is executed here all the time. So what if we were able to jump execution or call a function that is defined to be at the same location as the controller data? So this is where things get really interesting. So the data representing the state of the controllers can be treated as MIPS assembly instructions, and they can be executed just like any other code. Uh, by the way, Blaster Mac is currently going through and setting up uh, the rupee route. We're going through and getting certain things in a particular area. Uh, uh, going in through the main beginning area and getting certain rupees that we need for this exploit. So, right now, um, the specific code that gets executed uh, when, uh, I have to say this, uh, if, you, if you were to execute these controller inputs as code, what gets executed would depend on what angle of the control sticks you're, button, bu uh, control sticks you're pressing and what buttons you're pressing. Now, it might be really difficult for a real controller or a real player to hold 56 buttons and four analog sticks to precise X and Y coordinates, but my buddy Taskbot here has no problem with that. So, we're going to get him attached later. You'll, you'll see what kind of shenanigans he can be up to. Now, the original game developers never intended for players to execute the controller data as code, so we'll need to use some glitches to accomplish that. Luckily, within the starting area of the game, you can see a video on the screen here of kind of what we're going to be doing here, uh, there are some places where we can ec achieve arbitrary code execution, which, as it suggests, gives us the ability to execute any code that we want on the console. So the key glitch that enables this is known as stale reference manipulation. It's more commonly known as, known as a use after free exploit. So before I go on, I want to look at how the heap works in, the Ocar in Ocarina of Time. If you're unfamiliar, a heap is an area of dynamically allocated memory where data blocks of different sizes are reserved for use by various objects and functions. In Ocarina of Time, there's a specific heap that's called the actor heap. It contains code and data for all of the actors currently loaded in the game. An actor in this context is any sort of entity. It doesn't matter whether it's link, NPCs, rupees, even some hidden objects and triggers. Now, there are two main kinds of things held in the actor heap. There are actor overlays that basically contain code that runs for each type of actor, how they behave and how they react, and then the actors themselves. If there are multiple instances of a single actor, say a rupee, only one actor overlay needs to be loaded into the heap since they all share the same code. So you'll have several actors, they'll all point to the same overlay. You'll have several rupees, they'll only point to one rupee overlay. So the actors themselves hold the data for each individual instance of that actor, stuff like the position, the rotation, and that actor's state. Actors are loaded into and out of the game all the time, and they're allocated memory on the heap dynamically while that happens. So the game will search the heap for a free chunk of memory. Basically, it's going to start at the top all the way at 801DAA00 and search for space all the way down, working its way down to this corner at 8023AB90. Uh, yes, we're using this particular no donation with, uh, notation with a dollar sign. It's a stylistic choice of the animator. <laughs> uh, if a new type of actor is loaded, the corresponding actor overlay is lo loaded as well. So when transitioning to a new area, all of the actors in the new area are allocated to the heap before all of the old actors are freed. This results in actors and overlays being assigned memory locations that aren't consistent. Their location and memory will depend on exactly how many actors were already loaded and how they were organized within the heap structure. The signpost actor, for instance, that we're looking at here, back up just a bit. Okay, that signpost actor, oh, come on. Okay, it's going too fast, there we go. Uh, it might be loaded in one place in the heap, but if we leave the area and come back, it might be somewhere else, like 
adjusted over there. And uh, some actors might need to keep a pointer or a reference to another actor in their data. So this fact that they can move around is actually very important. So for example, the boomerang here, under normal circumstances, keeps a reference to the actor that it's grabbed, such as a rupee, which you can see uh, you would want to be able to, to carry that rupee back to Link. Under normal circumstances, if an actor references a second actor, the second actor should not unload or be freed from the heap before the first actor either unreferences it or unloads itself. If it happens, we would call this a stale reference. It's pointing at something that's no longer there. The pointer this actor has, has is now pointing to a memory location that's not being used anymore, and it means that if another actor were to be allocated into the heap, at that location where the old actor used to be, the first actor would be pointing to an actor that it probably shouldn't have access to, like this, uh, this item here. So using the boomerang example, by unloading the actor it's grabbed by going through a room transition while it's off screen, a different actor will take its, its spot. This, is, this can cause the boomerang to modify that new actor's position instead, which can cause unusual behavior like objects teleporting around. And this is an example of an actor being allocated in the same memory uh, allocation location as an older actor. So uh, the question then becomes, what would happen if an actor overlay loaded into this memory location uh, was, you know, maybe we've got something different. Like maybe, in other words, what if the boomerang modifies an actor's position well, when, it move, when it modifies it, what's it actually doing? Let me just jump ahead a bit. Okay. So for all actors, their X and Y and Z and coordinates in the world space are held at offsets 24, 28, and 2C within their allocated memory block in the heap. The boomerang will take the address to the pointer that the actor is holding, and these values, uh, add these values to it, and then write that data at those memory locations. So this would effectively modify the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the actor it's holding. However, if a stale reference that is now pointing to an actor overlay uh, Instead, if it's, if it's a stale reference, some unintended side effects can occur. Because each actor overlay is different, um, but they're just blocks of data. So the boomerang is still going to obliviously write data to offsets 24, 28, and 2C into that memory block. But it'll be writing 32-bit float data into places where 32-bit MIPS assembly instructions are supposed to be held. If the code for this overlay gets executed, after the boomerang modifies it, it will likely crash because it's probably not going to be sensible data. It might be completely invalid assembly instructions. But what if we could control exactly what values were being written by the actor and what instructions from the overlay are being written, overwritten? So we could effectively modify the code that the game executes. We could maybe make it do different things, basically whatever we like. And this is the essence of a stale reference manipulation or a use after free exploit. Okay. So in the Triforce percent run, what we're referring to this, this run, we achieve SRM by getting Link to pick up an item while it's culled. In other words, it's not being drawn because it's either off screen or too far away from the camera. Without allowing the item to be unculled, in other words, put back in view, we pass through a loading zone so that the item unloads and Link has a stale reference to it. We then come back through the loading zone to get a particular actor overlay to occupy the memory that was originally taken up by the item that Link, was, Link is holding. But, bef uh, but before doing all of that, we have to get the heap in a very specific state. So it may seem that actors being loaded and unloaded and freed from the heap is random. It's actually very deterministic. By collecting items such as rupees, we can prevent them from loading in uh, each time the loading zone is triggered. Also, since Mido is nearby, he's a character that you're gonna see in a second, the direction the camera that's facing is important as well, because he's also on screen. So if the camera is facing toward the main room, Mido won't unload, causing his overlay to stay put while his actor instance moves around in memory. By switching the direction of the camera while walking back and forth over this loading zone, all of the actors and the actor overlays in the heat get shifted around in a very precise way. So the data you're seeing at the top of the screen is the actual data in memory. It's just animated here with different symbols so you can see what that might look like as a representation. So after the seemingly arbitrary walking back and forth in this hallway, the heap will be laid out in such a way that it'll allow a very specific actor overlay to load in, the, in that location, and we want that to happen for later. So I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit here. Oh, that was too far. Okay, so normally the camera sticks around Link as you're playing the game, making it impossible to pick up an item and walk around with it while it's culled, but we can use a glitch to force the camera to always stay behind Link 
and then use another glitch. Whoa, that was a glitch. <laughs> I lost my notes. Uh, we can use another glitch to, okay, yeah, there's this rock that we're gonna talk about here in just a second. Let me get back into my notes here. Okay, so we've got this rock that we're gonna mess with a lot. We're gonna mess with this rock quite a bit, and it's gonna cause him a lot of trouble, by the way. <laughs> this rock is kind of a pain in the butt. But, uh, okay. So we're gonna get this, uh, come on, let's play again for me. There we go, good animation, okay. Okay, so this rock here is actually pretty interesting. We're gonna use this glitch to force the camera to always stay behind Link. We're gonna use another glitch to move around while a text box is open so that we can get the camera to move very far away from Link, which will call any actors that are near him. So because of the heat manipulation we did earlier, we know exactly where in the heap data th this rock is. It's at 801F7310. You can see that on the screen on the right there. When Link is carrying an actor, he updates the position and rotation of that actor so that it appears in his hands over, overhead. You can see us uh, walking um, in an area that is kind of hard to see, so we put an overhead camera in here. The rotation of an actor is a 16-bit value, and it's, it's stored at offset B4 from the start of the actor's data. So if the rock is stored at this address, we know that the address will be the one that's modified. In this case, the rotation value is just Link's rotation's value. Since it's very easy to control what angle Link is facing by walking around, this is the value we can use to write arbitrary data, which gets interpreted as arbitrary code when executed as part of the actor overlay, as you'll see in just a second. So the camera is still stuck in a position very far away. We carry it through this invisible rock all the way to this loading zone, and then walking back and forth through it uh, one last time. So the rock that Link is holding gets unloaded because it's cold away. And because of the heat manipulation we did earlier, an actor overlay gets allocated in the same memory region that the rock took up earlier. So you see Link is walking, uh, you have an overhead camera view that uh, allows us to kind of see where Link is going. You can see he's wandering into this other loading zone area, and that causes all of that memory change to happen. So there's a function that is gonna be really important that belongs to an item, an actum, actor known as the wonder item. So this wonder item is, is kind of interesting. So it's an invisible actor that triggers the collection of invisible items such as rupees. And there's a function within the actor overlay that gets run whenever the wonder item is uncalled, which is uh, whenever it's in view of the camera. So it lines up with the address we have control over thanks to SRM. So the exact instruction we end up overwriting is a branch instruction. Now we have uh, we have, each instruction is about 30, is, uh, yeah, is 32 bits wide, but the rotation value is just 16 bits. So we can only manipulate half of the instruction, which is the branch offset, this 0002 portion. We can, write, we can replace the branch offset with any value from 8,000 to 7 FFF, which is negative 32,768 to positive 32,768 in decimal. It means that when the game executes this instruction and branches, we can get the program counter to jump over 32,000 instructions, forward or backward. The instruction that we're working with is located in address 801F73C4. So we can jump as far forward as 802173C4, and as far back as address 801D73C8. The only problem is the controller data is stored at 8011D790, which is outside of that range. What it means is that we have to daisy chain our jump, jump instructions because we can't, we can't jump all the way to where we need to be in just one hop. With this modified branch, we can jump to somewhere else in heap, and because of our precise heap manipulation, we know exactly where everything is loaded. This means we can encode a longer jump instruction somewhere within the memory of the heap that jumps directly to the controller data, then have our modified branch instruction branch to this new jump instruction. So the main disadvantage of this is we, uh, we have some limitations. <laughs> it's, it's kind of frustrating. Um, it only has 16 bits that we can work with. We need more than that. So a jump instruction allocates a full 26 bits to the jump address, which is enough to get us to the controller data. 
So if we had to locate, uh, uh, we, we need to find uh, 32 bits somewhere in memory to locate. And it turns out that uh, the data in the heap for, uh, there's a portion of the data in the heap that's, uh, that has data for Link himself, like his angle, his movement angle, which direction he's moving, which things he's targeting, and so on. So what we need to do is orient Link at a very precise angle so that those two angles, when interpreted as a single MIPS instruction, encode a jump instruction that jumps to the controller data. So our whole point here is trying to get the code to jump to the controller data, right? So it's not easy to do, but we can align the camera with exact cardinal directions, then perform actions that are known to rotate Link by an exact amount, and that will allow us to get the angles that we need. So here are the values that we're going to get written in preparation for that. At 801F73C4, uh, the rotation value of 8F80 is written in order to make the branch instruction jump to 801DB1C8. Now, this isn't the exact address that we need to jump to, but it's close enough, and the game eventually makes it down to there. So that's located at 801DB25C and encodes a jump address to 8011D77C. This isn't Exactly, oh, pardon, um, by the way, that was uh, just catching up here a little bit. Um, we're basically getting everything set up so that we can take Link's movement and his angles and make them into actual jump instruction that's valid. So we've, we've shown you a video of kind of what it takes to get set up. We're going to try to do it live. It might work. It might not work. We're going to find out. Uh, this is a very tricky glitch, and you're going to see why in a second. So I'm going to switch away from my prepared slides, and we're going to pull this up here. All right. So Blaster Mac is going to attempt to get this rock in particular working. So uh, this is the fun part, <laughs> trying to get the camera locked correctly and get this what we call a, a return a state is very tricky. Takes a couple of attempts. Do you want to talk about what you're doing here? Um, well, right now I'm uh, setting the heap up in such a way that we know um, uh, what it's going to be when we pick up the rock. So I'm walking back and forth between loading zones and unloading and loading stuff in a certain way so that we kind of get a better idea of what we're doing. Um, and then, um, after I'm done, I will perform a glitch called return A. Um, that locks the camera in place, and I will try to do some blind movement. And what we'll get that uh, in just a second. So if everything is correct. So this is a glitch that locks the camera in a funny way, and it makes your, see where it says put away? If this is done correctly, what ends up happening is it changes to return. So now you've, you've got this return state stuck, and it means that the camera is going to stay there. Looks like we lost our game audio, but that's OK. I'm actually unsure why we lost our game audio. We, that's OK. I think we lost audio from game. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, we actually need those audio cues. We're going to need serious time here in a second, because he'll need to listen to audio cues. OK. So right now, he's walking back over to a, uh, this, this in, crawl area. And this will lock Link's camera in a different direction. There we go. There you go. And now I think you're going to get medieval on a sign. What did that sign do to you? It was just in the way. It was in the way. Throwing nuts at it just to make a break. All right. Now, this is going to require some interesting work here. It needs to lock the camera behind Link. And there's this rock we talked about earlier. This rock is kind of a pain. So we've got to get this angle just right. And if it works, it'll say grab at the top. You got it. There we go. OK. Now, <laughs> Okay. this is serious time. So he has to listen to some audio cues and hear, listen to some, media, um, uh, some audio be uh, music beats. So here, take it away. So stop me if you need to uh, stop talking. But one of the reasons that we've had difficulty over the past two weeks to reproduce what Save State did is uh, Save State's just amazing at this game. They've spent a lot of time practicing, doing rather 
intense glitches like this all the time. Oh. Well, that was a different one. So yeah, we're uh, we're probably gonna have to call it in a bit. You want to try one more time? I will try one more time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, bummer. Looks like you're too far south, maybe? I think so. Let me try one more time, then we, sure. uh, then we can continue. I don't want to hold up the presentation too much. That's OK. OK, that's, that was my attempt. That was your attempt? OK. okay. All right. That's OK. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. Uh, because this is so dang tricky, what we're going to do is switch to a shortcut ROM. And this is not giving up by any stretch. Um, so basically, the shortcut ROM is going to allow us to uh, go ahead and switch off. Yeah, you're good. The shortcut ROM is going to allow us to basically put the game in the state of getting the wonder item without having to do all of the complicated human setup. It's fascinating that this particular run requires both a human runner and a taskbot. So Taskbot is currently connected to the controller ports, uh, 2, 3, and 4 right now. We're going to connect him to controller port 1 as well here in a little bit. Normally, if you were to do this on stage the way Save State did it a couple of weeks ago, you would have all of Link's positions right, and everything would be perfectly in order. But it's really hard to reproduce, so the shortcut ROM replaces only 271 bytes. All it does is takes the original 1.0 release of the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, patches 271 bytes, and makes it so that the wonder item appears immediately when you walk forward from the starting location. So, you ready? Yeah. All right, so what you're seeing here is uh, we've got a different game, a uh, different, different uh, ROM. This is a shortcut ROM. And I am going to pull up a terminal here. And let's do, 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 do. OK. All right, we are going to do. All right, you ready? He's all hooked up. OK. Oh, uh, actually, you need to uh, reconnect oh. and really, uh, tell Navi to go away. Navi gets, gets very happy. She really wants to tell you something. And if you don't talk to her, uh, you also have to change your camera angle back because you're currently. Oh, no, it did it. OK, you're good. All right, we're good. All right, I'm here good. goes. So we have this terminal here. I'm going to move it up so you can see what's going on here. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Here we go. So this is going to be using a TAS TM32 replay device made by Onosaurus. It's this little red box that TASBOT's holding in his hands. We're going to be using player ports 1, 2, 3, and 4. We're going to be sending a shortcut ROM. And I'm going to hit Enter now. And then funny things are going to happen. So this is pressing buttons on the controller. And it's making Link do a lot of crazy things. Because as the moment we crossed that threshold, it started loading these instructions as, as data. And they're actually being, uh, being stored right now. So we're going to see what happens here in a second. OK. That green line in the upper left corner means that this was successful. Now, a whole lot of things just happened. I'm going to do one other quick uh, script here, which is we're going to do fixed. This is sending data over controller ports 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's happening there in just a second. But we are actually transmitting data, first very slowly and increasingly quickly, to the console. Now, there's one more we're going to do. Okay. And at this point, it's now no longer using controller port 1. So Blaster Mac can unplug controller port 1, plug back in to controller port to, uh, to, to his controller. And now all he has to do is fix up some memory by entering uh, this house over here. And uh, you can see, yeah, he has to start. Uh, enter the pause menu and exit, and enter and exit a house. So that will allow us to. Um, uh, that'll allow us to get everything to the point where we can now do anything we wanted to with this game. I'm going to give you a sneak preview of what that looks like, uh, but it, it ends badly for Link if you're not careful. OK. What we now have is arbitrary code that allows us to take over the game and do whatever we like. And there's a ton of beta content that was included in Ocarina of Time that most people have never seen before. And one of them is this crazy thing they imported from Star Fox. It's an R-Wing. This is in the cartridge. We didn't put this there. This is actually in the cartridge. And, and if you stand around, um, it, it, you can target it. We assume they use this to test a boss. 
But if you stand around long enough, it will start shooting at you, which is very friendly. Um, right now, we are weaponless, so we're just going to run back into a house and make it go away. I think that works. I don't know if it does bad things. I think the intended choice is to kill it, but I think this works too. Um, so we're going to pause here. Now, keep in mind, in the background, TaskBot is still connected and is still sending a whole lot of data, and we're going to talk about what's going on there in just a second. But for now, we're going to leave that game behind and get back to what's actually happening here. And this is really, really nutty. Like, really, really nutty. OK. So we had a lot that just happened. But now, Bootstrapper 1, there's multiple layers of bootstrapping here. So there's Bootstrapper 1, which is running control data as assembly instructions, which is very, very slow. So we want to write a smaller program that gets us a little faster. So we make Bootstrapper 2, and then Bootstrapper 3, and then Bootstrapper 4, and then we make a hyperspeed loader. So each one of these is, is basically building up our uh, control over the system and how fast we can send data. So we basically write a program to write a program to write a program to write a hyperspeed loader to write even more data that becomes a program. It gets interesting. Once you get total control, you can do some fun things. So let's talk about how it's treating that controller data as assembly code. So there's just 24 bytes of memory dedicated to the controllers. There are two bytes for the buttons, two bytes for the analog stick. And I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit here. OK. So those are the, uh, there's two bytes for the analog stick, two for yeah, let's see, there's an error code byte and one zero byte. There's four sets of those, and each of them, uh, one, one for each of the controllers. Now, a MIPS assembly instruction is always 32 bits long, or four bytes, and aligned to a four byte boundary. So if the controllers are created, uh, treated as assembly instructions, here's how they'll be organized. The first instruction consists of the first controller's buttons, and I'm just going to need to go back up here a little bit here. So the first instruction consists of this first controller's buttons and analog stick bytes. The second instruction is the first controller's error code, a zero byte, and the second controller buttons. The third instruction is the second controller analog bytes, its error code, and then a zero byte. And then the next three instructions are the same, just for controllers three and four. So if a, contro if a controller is connected, uh, which all four of them are in this case, the error code is just zero, denoting no error. This means these four instructions will always be half zero, which is not very helpful. Additionally. Other code in the game zeroes out all input from, from controllers 2 and 4 completely, since they were used for some debugging features. And we don't have the ability to read them at all before uh, they get wiped out. So this leaves us with only two instructions we fully control, or rather, almost fully control. There are uh, only 14 buttons on a Nintendo 64 controller, which means there are two bits in this, that, um, in this data that will uh, be mapped. They'll always be zero, basically. So we have to limit ourselves to instructions that already have those as zero, basically. It's kind of annoying, but it gets the job done. So after executing the controller data as code, we still need to return back to the normal game function. And we can't just let the program counter keep running, or it'll just crash. So we have to reserve our last instruction as a jump back to safety. Uh, we have to get, we're currently running in this wonder item code, so we have to return from that function. There are two bits that are always forced to zero, so we can't use a encode a return instruction and we need to restore the stack, but we can't do this in only one instruction. So we have to encode a jump instruction to some code which restores the stack for us. So unfortunately, this means we are limited to a single instruction. As long as that wonder item is on screen, this code will be run every single frame, and we can change which buttons are being pressed on each frame. So we can execute whatever we like. Uh, da, 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 da. But it's kind of slow. It, it basically, this game runs at 20 frames a second. And in order to account for lag frames, we have to send each one twice. That gives us a final speed of one instruction per two frames at 20 frames per second, or about 10 instructions per second. That's not very much. So with only one instruction, uh, we really can't do a whole lot. <laughs> There's just not, not much. So we have to use a global uh, pointer to b basically bounce data into. And this global pointer register allows us to uh, do, 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 store one on one instruction and then load it into other areas of memory later. So our first bootstrapper alternates between loads and stores back and forth. So it writes a program we call bootstrapper 2. 
So now we're doing uh, 10 bytes every second. Okay. So Bootstrapper 2, it re-enables the controller ports 2 and 4. It jumps to controller data right away. It restores the wonder item overlay. Uh, so that allows us to patch some code. And uh, now we're getting one instruction per frame, 60 frames a second. That gives us two bytes per two instructions. So now we're at 60 bytes a second. And we're getting there, but it's still pretty slow. We can do, we can do better. So Bootstrapper 3. And then, I'm sorry, I went right past it. So Bootstrapper 4, I'm going to just jump ahead a little bit, because um, I am running out of time, and I, I really want you guys to see the payload here. Um, Bootstrapper 4 restores a few things that were kind of mangled. Uh, it gets done injecting its code, and it does a jump instruction directly to the controller ports. Uh, there's some other annoying things about these bits always having to be zero, but that gets us 480 bytes a second. But now we, we use that to load the hyperspeed loader. Now, the hyperspeed loader, loader no longer jumps to controller data. Uh, it reads all 90 bits available from uh, controllers 2 through 4. It pulls the controllers eight times for every frame. And that gives us a final rate of 5,400 bytes per second, which is pretty good. OK, now we're going to pause here and go back to the game, because there's some more stuff to show you. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what you can do here. Um, I would love to be able to show you everything, but with only a few minutes left, we're going to have to jump straight to the finale, which is we have now finished loading all of the data that we needed to send over controller ports 2, 3, and 4. And what we're, what we're going to show you at this point is we built not just the ability to pull out the R wing, but we built out the ability to do anything, anything we wanted to. And there is so much lore in this game that we would love to show you, but we don't have a whole two hours to do it. So we built up several different stages of getting Link's heart in balance, doing, an, doing a quest that involves courage, and another one that involves wisdom, and another that involves power, and going to stages and talking to them, this whole additional quest of all this awesome stuff. And at the end, Link is granted access to a particular room that we want to show you. You're going to want some extra game audio out of this now. There we go. After 23 years, the dreams of millions of players around the world have finally come true. The Triforce was rumored to exist in early beta videos, all kinds of other references to it, but it never made it in the final game. You couldn't ob obtain the Triforce. But we were able to put it into the game ourselves, along with so many other things. Now, Link has obtained the Triforce, and the goddesses have a question for him. And I like this question a lot. You can see it in just a second. I can't make this part go faster. <laughs> if you go watch the Summer Games Done Quick 2020 run, you will see the entirety of the quest that leads up to this. It's an incredibly moving story with all kinds of absurd things like beating the running man and uh, using all kinds of glitches and beta content in interesting ways. But I really want you to see this next scene. I want you to remember that this console is, other than an RGB mod that passively taps the red, green, and blue, button, uh, blue uh, lines, it does not modify the console in any way. And this is, other than that small bit to jump to the wonder item, this is the original US 1.0 release. Now, we could be king of Hyrule or ask for rupees, but I think everyone wants to see the future. So let's do it. As Link makes his journey, I just want to pause for a moment and talk about how what we're doing here is transformative art. We're taking a game that is beloved by so many people, and we're transforming it into something new. Everything you're seeing here is being done directly on this N64. Enjoy.
If we can get some additional game audio, you're going to want it here. All right, so uh, I don't know exactly if this is going to work. We're going to try. I've got to find the right, uh, the right command. Oh, gosh, I didn't actually see what. Uh, we had a power outage right before this. Uh, we were editing some scripts and uh, have no idea uh, whether or not this will work. I currently actually can't even find the uh, script for it. <laughs> Let's see. Da, 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 da. I don't think this is going to work. So go ahead and advance forward. Uh, in the original Look. version, we had Twitch messages appearing one after the other. Um, this entire sky was filled with people who had typed here together, people remote, people in the audience at, at, at uh, Games Done Quick. This whole movement of people coming together after two and a half years of a pandemic that kept us apart was just such a moving moment for everyone. And uh, I wish we could reproduce it here, but uh, there's not nearly enough people, and there were something like uh, 100, 150,000 people watching at the time. Nice to see our future. <laughs> this run at Games Done Quick raised $227,000 for Doctors Without Borders. It was the incredible cap of two and a half years of effort, 25 people working on it for a very long time and putting their heart and soul into it. I don't know if we can ever transform a game quite like this ever again. Thank you, Link, for all you have done for us. Zelda Hime, arigato. Isho ni mirai wa tsukurimashou ka? As we close out, you can watch the credits on the screen here. Uh, these credits will be playing in the background where I'll herald, herald this out. Thank you so much uh, for showing us that. That was awesome. Technical issues aside, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. Uh, an unmodified, or almost unmodified, games cartridge you. Come on, give it up for these two. That was incredible. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have no time for questions. We're running a little bit tight here, um, but I'm, maybe these two will hang around afterwards. Uh, if anyone wants to come up and ask any questions of them, that would be awesome. Um, yeah. There we go. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>